Hey everyone, I'd like to take a minute to announce a new feature to the podcast. I've set up a hotline where you, the listener, can submit your very own true disturbing encounters. You simply call the number and it goes straight to voicemail, so you don't even need to talk to anyone. Tell me your story and make sure you leave either a name or a nickname and the area you're from. Your story just might get featured on the podcast. Now, if your story is so crazy and detailed that you want to discuss it further, leave your contact info in the call and I'll reach out. The hotline is open and accepting submissions 24-7, so give us a call now at 701 712 8 008. Again, that's 701 712 8008. Now, if you want your recording to be a little bit better quality, I suggest you record it directly using the voice recorder on your phone. The quality just seems to be better this way. Just try not to use speakerphone when you're recording. If you have your own high end microphone set up, that works great as well. You can email your submission to disturbedpod20 at gmail.com. That's disturbedpod20 at gmail.com. I can't wait to hear your stories. Now let's get into the episode. And let me tell you, this story is crazy. There are so many twists and turns in this case that you won't be sure what to believe. So, settle in, and let me tell you the story of Asia Degree. In the early morning hours of February 14, 2000, and for reasons unknown, nine-year-old Asia Degree packed her book bag, left her family home, and began walking along nearby North Carolina Highway 18 despite heavy rain and wind. She was seen by several passing motorists, and when one turned around and began to approach her to see if she needed help, Aisha left the roadside and ran into a wooded area. In the morning, her parents discovered her absence. No one has seen Aisha since. This is Disturbed. The Disappearance of Aisha Degree. Aisha Degree was born in Shelby, North Carolina on August 5, 1990. Her parents were Harold and Akia, and they had been married for two years. A year earlier, in 1989, Akia gave birth to her son named O'Brien. So when Aisha was born, she was their second and youngest child. O'Brien and Aisha were less than 12 months apart in age. At the age of nine, Aisha was really coming into her own. She was a fourth grade student at Falston Elementary, and by all accounts, she was described as an outstanding student with an exceptional attendance record. When it came to education, she had a knack for science and math. She also enjoyed reading and writing, and she even had ambitions to become an illustrator. Apart from excelling in her education, Aisha really loved sports, especially basketball. She was the point guard on her peewee basketball team, the Falston Bulldogs. And it was actually her first time playing team sports because, by all accounts, she was really shy. Aisha's brother was also heavily involved in sports, and he was on the boys' basketball team. Now, growing up, the Degree family was very religious, and they attended Macedonia Missionary Baptist Church every week without fail. Aisha loved church, and she was always eager to go to her weekly Bible study. The Degree family also lived on the same street as Harold's sister and mother, so they had family living right there. Isha and O'Brien's life was one that was centered around their extended family, church, and school. Harold was a dock loader at PPG Industries Incorporated in Shelby, and Akia would actually build pianos at a company called Kauai America in Lincolnton. 
Harold typically worked second shift, so he would go in sometime in the afternoon until about 11.30 p.m. Now because their parents were at work during the day, Aisha and O'Brien would work on homework or visit relatives' homes in the area until their parents got home from work. Both kids had their own house keys and they were recognized as being responsible kids. According to teachers, coaches, and relatives, Aisha was a well-behaved girl who seemed happy to live within the rules. She wasn't one for confrontation, and wasn't known as someone who got into trouble often. Another thing about Aisha was that she was very scared of dogs because she hated it when they would jump on her. She was also too shy to try out for a solo in the church choir. This gives you an idea of the type of person Aisha was. Quite shy, non-confrontational. Now, Harold and Akia had a rule. They didn't want their kids to be able to talk to strangers on the internet. So the family did not have internet access or even a computer at their home in order to protect their kids. I'm going to walk you through a few of the things the degrees were doing in the days leading up to Aisha's disappearance, just to give you an idea of what was going on in their lives at the time. So on February 11th, O'Brien and Aisha have the day off from school for President's Day. Because both their parents are working, the siblings spend the day with their aunt, and depending on which source you read, this aunt's name is either Keisha or Alicia. So for the sake of the story, we're going to call her Keisha, and this is Harold's sister. Keisha, her husband, and their children, along with Harold's mom, all live right across the street from the degrees. In the afternoon, Keisha takes O'Brien and Aisha to basketball practice at their school. Falston Elementary. According to Aisha's coach, Chad Wilson, the practice was ordinary, and Aisha was acting like her typical self. She was laughing with the other girls at practice, having a good time. Both O'Brien and Aisha head home after practice, capping off a typical, normal day. The next day, on Saturday, O'Brien and Aisha both have basketball games, so the Degree family head over to the Burns Middle School, where the games are held. The girls' team plays first, and they lost their first game of the season by one point. Aisha fouled out of the game and blamed herself for her team losing. Akia said that the other girls were very disappointed, even to the point of crying, because they lost their first game of the season. Aisha said she was crying because she hurt her leg in the game, but eventually she was playing with her friends and watching her brother's team. Aisha then admitted that her leg was actually fine and wasn't hurt in the first place. Aisha's coach, Chad Wilson, reported that Aisha was cheering on her brother and playing with her teammates during O'Brien's game. He also confirms that, like always, both parents were at both games that day. After the games, the degrees head home. Aisha goes to a sleepover at her cousin's house, and this is presumably the same aunt and cousin's house that's right across the street. Aisha and her cousins have a typical sleepover. They stay up late, hanging out, watching TV. According to her cousin Katina, who was 15 at the time and hosted the slumber party, over a dozen cousins and family members were sleeping over that day. The next morning, on Sunday, Aisha's aunt and grandmother take her and some of the other cousins to church at Macedonia Baptist Church in Shelby, where they meet up with the rest of Aisha's immediate family. According to Akia, Aisha seemed like her normal happy self at church. After church, the family left for Harold's sister's house to have lunch. Aisha's grandmother Joanne gave her a bag of Valentine's Day candy as a gift. The bag was mostly made up of cinnamon discs, which were Aisha's favorite type of candy. Afterwards, the Degree family returned home. The next day, Monday, was Valentine's Day, as well as the Degree's 12th wedding anniversary. Now, I'm going to warn you, from here on out, the timeline gets pretty confusing. But it's really important to try and point out the specific times that have since been mentioned by the family members. At about 8 p.m., Aisha and O'Brien head to bed early, and they actually share the same bedroom. As a crazy stroke of bad luck, there was actually a car accident in the neighborhood that caused a power outage that night. The time at which this happened is contested. There's a lot of differing reports, but usually it's pinned at around 9 p.m. Harold got home around 12.30 a.m. and the power came on shortly thereafter. Once he was home, he checked on the kids and they were sound asleep in their beds. 
Harold decides to relax for a couple hours and then check down the kids one more time before going to bed around 2.30 a.m. Now, there are a few sources that say that Harold left home sometime in this two-hour period to go and get Valentine's Day candy, but it's hard to substantiate that claim. Not too long later, O'Brien woke up to the sound of Aisha getting out of bed to use the restroom. And not too long after that, he hears her bed squeak. And so he just thinks that she's crawling back into bed and he didn't really pay any attention to it and went back to sleep. And this is where things get a little mysterious. Akia woke up around 5.45 a.m. and got a bath ready for the kids because they didn't take one the night before. At 6.30, she went to wake up Aisha and O'Brien. When she went into the room, she noticed O'Brien was sound asleep, but Aisha was not in her bed. She thought this was a little strange, but actually wasn't entirely worried up front. She just figured Aisha was somewhere else in the house, so she started looking, expecting to find her. But as she went room to room, looking for Aisha, panic started to set in. She wasn't there. Ikea went outside to check in their two vehicles, hoping that maybe she was there. But she wasn't. She then wakes up Harold, who tells her to call his mother and see if Aisha was over there. But she wasn't there either. Akia then called her own mother. Still no luck. Where was Aisha? At this point, Harold called the police. Now, just to point out, there are a lot of contested facts in terms of when exactly certain things happened on this night. Specifically, the kids' bedtime and when the power went out. A lot of sources give different times for when the kids actually went to bed. Was it 8, 8.30, 9, somewhere in there, some combination of the two? And also the power outage. Was it 7, 8.30, 9, or 10? A lot of different sources give different times on these. Now, the police arrive about 10 minutes later, around 6.40 a.m., and right away, they bring in search dogs. But they weren't able to pick up a scent on Asia, and this possibly could have been because of the thunderstorm that had just gone through. Either way, Aisha's family and the police begin scouring the local neighborhood. By noon, over 60 people, including residents, the church congregation, and a helicopter with infrared heat detection were assisting in the search. They spend all afternoon searching nearby woods and fields, but nothing was found. But when Aisha's family checked out her bedroom for clues, they found that her backpack was missing. And that's where she kept her house key. Also missing was her Tweety Bird purse and some clothes. They also noticed that all of the doors and windows in the home had been locked. And so that really points to Aisha leaving on her own. And so the family is starting to put these pieces together and they realize that the squeaking that O'Brien heard wasn't actually Aisha crawling back into bed. But... It was her packing her book bag and getting ready to leave. And they have no idea why. Now, nothing was found from the initial searches, but Aisha's disappearance was broadcast on the local news that evening. And wouldn't you know it, several witnesses came forward. A trucker named Jeff Rupp says he saw a person who he believes to be Aisha walking south on State Highway 18. He described her as a child wearing a white dress, white sneakers, and no coat. He also described her as wearing pigtails. He says it was such a strange sight that he drove ahead to find a spot to turn around, and then he saw Aisha again. He said she was walking at a good pace with her head down like she had a destination in mind. He turned around again hoping to talk to her, but when he rolled down his window, Aisha ran into a wooded area off the road. This incident really bothered Jeff because he was the father of two young kids of his own. He couldn't imagine his own kids out there walking in the dark in the rain. Now, another trucker named Roy Blanton and his son, Roy Jr., says they saw someone matching Aisha's description briefly at about 4.30 a.m. Blanton and his son were truckers based out of North Carolina who regularly drove from Cleveland County to Chicago. 
Blanton described the person as, quote, a very small figure wearing light colored clothing. So he got on his CB radio and he warned other truckers in the area to be careful because there was a young woman walking on the road. The area where Aisha was seen walking was only a few blocks from her house. As darkness settled in over Shelby, the search had to be ceased for the night, but police had some new leads to work with. The next day on Tuesday, between 60 and 100 volunteers continue looking for Asia, with an emphasis on the area where Jeff Rupp last saw her. Investigators from neighboring counties are brought in, and Asia's family does an inventory of Asia's room. They discover that Asia left with her nightgown she was last seen wearing, a pair of light colored blue jeans, a white long sleeved shirt with purple lettering, and her white sneakers. She also took her black Tweety Bird purse and her black and beige book bag. O'Brien told the media that Aisha had gotten the Tweety Bird purse only a week earlier. Now, there are some later reports that mention other pieces of clothing that Aisha may have brought with her, like a pair of jeans with a red stripe and a vest. But these pieces are not mentioned in earlier sources. Investigators determined that there was no forced entry into the house and that there was no evidence of a crime scene in the home. Now, police are looking into everything at this point. There's a family named the Turners who live about a mile and a half south of the Degrees, and they have some buildings on their property. Police ask them to go through and search these buildings. So they do. During these searches, the Turners find a wallet-sized photo of a young girl, along with some trash in an unused chicken shed. The Turners turned over the photo to police, but... Neither the Degrees or the elementary school recognized the girl in the photo. And because of this, the Turners didn't hand over the rest of the items that they found, thinking they were unrelated. But they kept them just in case. And according to a later interview with the Turners, authorities declined to take the other items initially, but they came back for them later. These items were some candy wrappers, a pencil, a marker, and a Mickey Mouse-shaped hair bow. The next morning on Wednesday, searchers continue looking for Asia, but the air and search helicopters are called off by 9 a.m. Law enforcement reports that the ground search will be called off the next day unless evidence is found to suggest that Asia is still in the area. Cleveland County Sheriff's Office announced that they believe Asia was a victim of foul play. They have three main theories for Asia's disappearance. She was either abducted, it was a hit and run, or Asia is hurt or lost in the area she went missing. They also make another major announcement that the parents are not considered suspects in Asia's disappearance. A nationwide bulletin is sent out across the country for law enforcement agencies to be on the lookout for Asia. Jeff Rupp, who was that first trucker who saw Asia, is brought back to the scene by law enforcement where he formally identifies the exact location where he witnessed Asia run off the road. By the evening, the FBI conducts a polygraph on Jeff Rupp, who passes, and they report that they believe Rupp is telling the truth. Now, the area that Jeff Rupp indicated where Asia ran off into the woods is a field owned by a man named Charles Turner, and this area becomes the new focus of the search. And if you'll remember, this is the same area where the Turners found these candy wrappers and other items in their outbuildings. And now it's confirmed by Jeff Rupp that this is the area where he last saw Aisha run into the woods. So this area is now the prime searching area for police. So new life is breathed into the ground search now. This area has become the focus of the investigation. A searcher doing an inch by inch search of the Turner property found a candy wrapper near the outbuilding where the photo of the girl was found. Now, keep in mind, the Turners didn't hand over the rest of the items, including those candy wrappers, at this point, so police don't know about the connection. When the Turners are shown what was found outside, including that candy wrapper, they now make the connection, and they decide to turn over the rest of the quote-unquote trash that they had found in the shed, because they have similar candy wrappers. The Turners handed over some cinnamon disc candy wrappers, a hairbow, a pen, and a pencil that said Atlanta. 
The Degree family recognized the pencil as one Aisha bought a year earlier during a family reunion in Atlanta. The other items were Aisha's as well, and the wrappers matched the candy given to Aisha on Sunday. Now all searchers moved to this area to complete a thorough inch-by-inch search, but nothing else is found. Now, according to the Turners, the shed is filled with old furniture and equipment, and it also had no door, so Aisha could have simply just walked right into it. The shed itself is located about 600 feet away from the road, and to get there, Aisha would have had to have walked the length of two football fields uphill and crossed a three-foot-deep gully. But this wouldn't have been impossible because there was a light outside the shed that could have guided her. By the 18th, the hunt for Aisha swells to 500 searchers, with 100 people searching the area around the Turner shed. The woman who found the items inside the shed was named Rally Turner, and she gives an interview to the media. She says that the candy wrappers were red, the pencil was white and the hair bow was a solid yellow plastic hair accessory with a teddy bear image. Some other reports indicate that it was a Mickey Mouse hair bow. The Turner property was swarming with sheriff's deputies and searchers all day long. The temperature on February 18th dipped into the 40s, and it cast doubt on the idea that Aisha could still be alive if she was lost or injured outside. The search for Aisha would continue, but no additional evidence is found. The ground search is called off on the evening of February 20th. The next day at 3 a.m., law enforcement officials set up a roadblock. They want to talk to drivers who drive this highway in the early morning hours, hoping to find other witnesses who may have seen Asia on Valentine's Day. The roadblock was set up for three hours and found no additional clues. Now, on February 24th, a citizen calls in to the sheriff's office to tell them that Aisha's class is reading a book called The Whipping Boy. The book is a fictional story about two boys who run away from home and then return. This caller thinks that the story may have been a catalyst for Aisha to run away. Now that very same day, a neighbor of the Turners is interviewed by the media. He owns a lot behind the Turners shed and claims that he keeps six beagles in his yard. (laughs) Yeah, six. But on the night of Aisha's disappearance, he didn't hear anything from the dogs. And you would think with that many dogs, they would have made some sort of a sound. The Cleveland County Sheriff's Department also releases the photo of the girl that was found with Aisha's things in the shed. They're hoping to generate more leads. But to this day, the girl in this photo has never been identified. In the summer of 2000, a man contacts the sheriff's office. He's an inmate at the local county jail and a former high school classmate of Aisha's mom, Akia. His name is Baron Ramsey, and he has quite the story. We'll get into that right after this. This episode is made possible by Supporty. Are you struggling to stay motivated to the goals you've set for yourself? Maybe you're trying to wake up earlier, but you keep hitting that snooze button. Or maybe you're trying to cut back on sweets, but you find yourself opening the fridge when you're stressed out. Well, one of the best ways to make lasting behavioral changes is by an accountability partner who will help you stick to positive daily actions. So how do you find a reliable accountability partner who's going to engage with you and keep you honest? Supporty is a mobile app that matches you with accountability buddies for a week at a time. Supporty pairs you and a buddy up one-on-one. That's for maximum accountability. Plus, it's mutual, so you encourage your buddy and they encourage you each day of your seven-day session. What's really cool is you can see whether your partner accomplished their daily actions and they can see whether you've done yours too. If you want a more effective way to stay motivated, experience the difference of an accountability partner. Download Supporty, that's support with an I at the end, from the Apple App Store or Google Play Store, and make sure you choose Disturbed Podcast when you create your account to start your two-week free trial. You can check out the show notes of this episode for more details. Get encouragement, get motivated, and achieve more with Supporty. (laughs) 
Support for this episode comes from Audible. You guys already love podcasts, so I'd be willing to bet you'll love Audible too. They have the largest selection of audiobooks on the planet. I just finished The Stranger Beside Me by Anne Rule. It's the shocking true story of serial killer Ted Bundy. And this is an excellent follow-up to our very first episode with Kathy Kleiner. I binged this whole book in probably three days. They have all your favorite genres, bestsellers, mysteries, dramas, and everything in between. The best part of Audible for me is you can listen on the go, wherever you are. Whether you're driving or working out, whatever it may be. This is a game changer. Audible members get to choose one audiobook every month, regardless of price, as well as two Audible originals you can't get anywhere else. You can enjoy easy audiobook exchanges, rollover credits, and an audiobook library you keep forever, and you can access anytime, anywhere. You can get started with a 30-day free trial, and you'll get your first audiobook as well as two Audible originals completely free by visiting audibletrial.com slash disturbed. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash disturbed. Ramsey claims that on the night Aisha disappeared, he and another man were driving back to Shelby late at night after buying drugs in Hickory. They were driving in a pickup truck, and while they were driving, the men hit Aisha who was trying to cross the road. Ramsey's friend then put an unconscious Aisha in the back of the truck, dropped Ramsey off at home, and then left with Aisha still in the vehicle. Later, Ramsey and his friend dumped Aisha's body in Moss Lake. Now, this is quite the story, but law enforcement has their doubts. There was no evidence of a hit and run on Highway 18. And in addition to that, Moss Lake was dragged twice and searched by divers who found nothing. Now, according to a few sources, early on in the investigation, law enforcement dismissed the idea of a hit and run because they found no blood, no skid marks, or paint chips, or anything like that near where Aisha was last seen. And to top it off, at the time of his confession, Ramsey is facing federal charges for bank robbery, and law enforcement believes his story about Aisha was intended to get him a plea deal. Law enforcement has publicly admitted that after several months of investigation into Ramsey's story, they do not believe his story to be true. No evidence could be found in Moss Lake. The Degree family also does not believe Ramsey's story. As frustrating as it is, this sort of thing happens a lot with inmates trying to get plea deals. And it just makes it that much harder on the family. The first anniversary of Aisha's disappearance would come and go with no further leads. Articles are published regularly about Aisha's case and the anniversary of her disappearance, but no new information. In the months following Aisha's disappearance, the Degree family underwent polygraph testing, and they all passed. With no new leads coming in, Aisha's case was turning cold. But new information was about to come to light that would take the case in a different direction. On August 3rd of 2001, 26 miles away in Burke County, which was the opposite direction of where Aisha was seen walking, a contractor working on a construction project unearthed a backpack that was wrapped in two black plastic trash bags and buried. And written inside the book bag was Aisha's name and address. The bag was found located between North Carolina Highway 18 and a creek. Cadaver dogs were brought in to search the area, but they found nothing. The backpack and its contents were sent to the FBI for analysis. Inside the backpack were clothing, a piece of paper, and a pencil case. A few days later, witnesses and family are re-interviewed in hopes of finding more clues. It's brought up to the press that 99.9% .9 of what was in the bag was Aisha's, but not all of it. The search for Aisha continued in the area where the bag was found. The sheriff's captain, Billy Benton, mentions that they are specifically searching for the clothes Aisha went missing in, which were white sneakers, light-colored jeans, and a light-colored nightshirt, as well as possible grave sites. But nothing is found. 
It wouldn't be until July of 2003 that the FBI completed their testing on Aisha's book bag. But get this, the results from their findings were not released to the public. So we don't know what they found. And then something strange happened. On September 11th, a man named Danny Ray Johnson is arrested for the rape of a girl near Aisha's age. Johnson and his brother live near the site where Aisha's book bag was found, but both brothers deny any involvement in Aisha's case and give DNA samples. And these two look like such good suspects, but it turns out that they both have alibis for the time that Aisha disappeared. Both brothers were incarcerated at the time. In November of 2004, another tip would come in from a man in prison and it prompts investigators to conduct an excavation at the corner of Shelby and Rube Sprangler Road near Lawndale, North Carolina. During this search, law enforcement would uncover a pair of men's khaki trousers and some bones. But the bones were animal bones, and Aisha Degree was nowhere to be found. But the case was about to take yet another turn. In January of 2014, U.S. Marshals arrest a man named Donald Ferguson for the 1990 murder of seven-year-old Sholanda Poole. Sholanda's case has a lot of striking similarities to Aisha's. Ferguson was 29 when Sholanda went missing from her family's Hampton home on July 21st, 1990. Sholanda's body was found with signs of sexual assault and strangulation the next day in a wooded area behind a school. For many, Ferguson is a prime suspect in Aisha's case. After a thorough investigation into Donald Ferguson in a possible connection to Aisha, he's considered to not have any involvement in her case. In December 2014, he pleaded guilty to Shalanda's murder and was convicted of first-degree murder and first-degree sexual assault. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. And again, we're left with no answers in Aisha's case. In February of 2015, the Cleveland County Sheriff's Office and the FBI began to re-examine Aisha's case. They were going through all the evidence collected and re-interviewing people from the initial investigation. During this process, a major new lead surfaced in May of 2016. Law enforcement announced to the public that there may have been sightings of Aisha entering a dark green early 1970s Lincoln Continental Mark IV, or Ford Thunderbird with rust along the wheel wells. And this is huge because it gives investigators something tangible to focus on. According to the Sheriff's Department, they're looking for anyone who might know someone with either of those types of vehicles. According to the Sheriff's Department, the car is a vehicle of interest and could be a big clue in finding out what happened to Asia. But as is the case so many times in this story, nothing has come from this tip. Another three years would pass until something new would arise. In 2018, the FBI would release two new pieces of evidence. Inside Aisha's book bag was a concert t-shirt featuring the boy band New Kids on the Block and a children's book called McKilliot's Pool by Dr. Seuss. Neither item belonged to Aisha, although the book was from the library at Aisha's school. Investigators released images of the shirt and the book in 2018, hoping to jog the memories of people who may have helpful information. But as of today, where we currently stand, there are no prominent suspects in the case, even with this new information. Throughout all the years, the town of Shelby, North Carolina still has missing pictures of Asia plastered all throughout the area, as well as blue ribbons tied around trees and light posts, representing that her case has not been forgotten. For the Degree family, they've done everything possible to keep Asia's case shining in the media and their community. They created a scholarship in Asia's name after their son O'Brien graduated high school. To raise money for this award for a local student, they sell t-shirts with Aisha's picture on it and other charitable events. 
In addition, they host an annual walk where people gather together at the Degree family home and walk to the location where Aisha was last seen. It's been a grueling 18 years for the Degree family. They're plagued by so many questions without answers. Did Aisha leave on her own? If so, why? Did someone lure her away from her home? Is she still alive? If so, where? Akia still holds on to hope that her daughter is still alive and refuses to lose faith. O'Brien now has a daughter of his own. She's now almost the same age as Aisha was when she disappeared. According to Akia, her granddaughter is the spitting image of Aisha. Seeing her granddaughter only motivates her more to find her daughter and get some answers. If you have any information into the disappearance of Aisha Degree, you're asked to call the Cleveland County Sheriff's Office at 704-484-4822. You can see more photos and information on our website, disturbedpodcast.com. I'll have pictures of Aisha, her age progression picture, and photos of the vehicles. You've been listening to Disturbed. If you enjoyed this episode, help us grow by sharing the show with a friend. And make sure you subscribe wherever you're listening so you always get the newest episodes automatically. And don't forget to check out our Patreon fan club, where you can support the show and get exclusive perks like ad-free episodes, shoutouts, early access, and bonus episodes. You can do that over at disturbedpodcast.com slash fan club. You can find us on social at Disturbed Podcast. Remember, our brand new hotline is now live. This is where you can submit your very own true disturbing encounters. Give us a call now at 701-712-8008. I want to hear from you. We'll be back next week with a brand new episode.